Ten. Just make it this. <coughs> May I have your attention, please? Alhamdulillah, wa salli wa sallim wa rasulullah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for coming to tonight's program. And I hope that you will enjoy the program and you will learn uh, a lot from this uh, program. Uh, this program, in fact, is the first of its kind, and as far as I know, in recent history. I have not seen it done in any place else in the format we're proposing tonight. Uh, fortunately, we as uh, Christians and Muslims, we have lots in common, unfortunately, Many people do not realize this, do not realize that. And the point is we all believe in the, uh, in the one God who created you and me and created everybody else, created the heavens and the earth. And this belief is being shared by uh, both sides. Uh, there are lots of myths and lots of uh, misunderstanding that come from both sides. and I think that this meeting will help us a lot in terms of understanding and communicating with one another. Uh, in fact, when, we, when I thought about this, uh, this dialogue, I first time that came in mind uh, was when uh, Dr. Woodbury was here three years ago in Kansas City and we were making a dialogue and I suggested to him that we make a Christian Muslim, uh, uh, Christian Muslim conference. And uh, I proposed after that, since we uh, had lots of, uh, of dialogues between Christians and Muslims, and it seemed that uh, we learned the hard way, we learned through mistakes. And there were lots of mistakes in the dialogues that were made. Uh, people were uh, kind of uh, oriented towards winning or scoring some points. Uh, and hence, uh, somebody might come at the end of the program and throw a point that needs a, a whole session by itself, leaving no time for the other side to make comment or, or at least make a good explanation for the point. And hence I suggested uh, at the time to uh, uh, Dr. Woodbury and uh, to Dr. Jamal Badawi, uh, to Dr. Uh, Robert Douglas, to Dr. Muzammil Siddiqui that we should have a conference in which the papers will be presented. And in uh, that one, I suggested that each team sends his papers to me, and then I send it to the other side. They would review it and send it back to the other side. And then during that conference itself, everybody makes presentation of the paper and uh, defends his paper, like anybody who's defending a PhD or a master thesis. Same, similar to that. I mean, you know, it's not that way, but I'm just trying to make it simpler. And uh, that was the idea. However, time passed and uh, we could not make it that way because of, you know, everybody is busy. So I suggested uh, to the people who are here and to Dr. Uh, uh, Douglas that we should make it simpler just by having this kind of meeting, this kind of dialogue, a get together, a discussion. And that's how this dialogue was uh, brought about. Uh, and hence, you and I hope you now you realize that it's going to be a friendly and it's going to be a, a dialogue that is based on trying to understand one another. For the uh, dialogue itself, we will start with presentations. I'll talk to you now about the format. We'll start with presentation by each side during the next session, which is titled The Concept of God. As you see in the program, we have four basic uh, titles, and the first of them is the uh, concept of God. Then we'll move into prophethood and divinity of Jesus tomorrow, and the divinity, revelation and divinity uh, of the books. And then on Sunday, we'll discuss uh, salvation. So the first one here, we'll start with uh, 10 minutes presentation by each side, presenting his views on how they understand the concept of God in both sides. And after that, we'll start an interactive discussion. 
during, uh, among the panel members themselves. And at the end, during the last half an hour, we're going to start taking comments and reactions from you. That's the way it's going to be. And tomorrow, we'll talk to you about, just to save time now, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll delay talking about the rest of the program till tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, one point I wanted to mention that uh, this program is being uh, organized by the uh, Center for Islamic Information International, which is the people who are working on that and they have experience in that, including myself, including uh, Shakir. And uh, this is the Committee of the Religious Dialogue. And hopefully, depending on that dialogue, I hope you will let us pass the test. Because <laughs> we are hoping to have a better understanding, so uh, we'll uh, do the best we can to have this understanding. And uh, we'll have a break between 8 and 9. We'll make it 8, 10 till 9. So now we'll start the first session by a presentation of each side. Would you like to start or would you like to start? Whatever you prefer. Does it make any difference? Do you like this? Okay. <coughs> Let me start some other time. All right. Uh, both Christians and Muslims, in my understanding, uh, worship the same God, although we understand him in some ways differently, in many ways uh, the same. Uh, the Christians in Arabia use the word Allah for God before uh, the time of Muhammad. The Christians in the Arab world still use uh, the word Allah for uh, God. Furthermore, this would be in uh, keeping with my understanding of the Quran, where in the Quran, Surah 24, verse uh, 46, I can't quite get that. Could you get that on me? Quran verse 46 in the Egyptian, uh, 45 in the Flugel edition, it says, we believe in what has been sent down to you, our God and your God is one. So we are talking about the one creator being of the universe, even though the Christian would see him uh, incarnated, revealed through uh, Jesus Christ. Furthermore, for the attributes, we identify essentially the same attributes. Uh, in the names of God and uh, in the attributes that we stress. However, in my understanding, we sometimes stress different attributes. Uh, Orthodox Muslim theologians often stress the sovereignty of God. Uh, Christians often stress uh, the love of God. And, uh, However, the difference is not that uh, we don't believe, both believe in the love of God. One of the 99 names of God is the Wadud, the loving one. Uh, what I see as the difference is that uh, in the Quran and the Bible, uh, we have a difference in the, uh, the direction of love. That is, uh, in the Bible, God loves us even when we are unlovely. For example, Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or 1 John 4, 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself to be the propitiation for our sins. Whereas uh, in my reading of the Quran, uh, God's love is a reciprocal love. Uh, that is in Surah 3 verse uh, 29 in Flugel, 31 and 32 in the Egyptian edition. Uh, if you would love God, follow me. God will love you and forgive your sins. God is forgiving and merciful. Uh, but if you turn your backs, God loves not the disbelievers or the ungrateful. Furthermore, there are similar attitudes towards God. <clears throat> Uh, the whole concept of insha'Allah, if God wills, is certainly a biblical principle too, uh, in James 4.15. Uh, the concept of Islam itself, that is, of submission to God, is certainly a biblical principle. Uh, again, in the epistle of James, uh, we are told to, uh, that Christians are to submit uh, to God. The basic 
difference then seems to come more in the area of the Trinity or the Trinity in unity. Uh, one thing we have to note at the very beginning is that Christians do believe in the unity of God. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says the Lord our God is one Lord. Mark 12, uh, 28 through 30, here is where Jesus is speaking. He says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so we do believe in the unity of God and whatever we say about his revelation uh, in three ways or through what have been called three persons, uh, this is still a way of expressing uh, the unity of God. Now, I am not at all sure that the Quran is rejecting an orthodox Christian view of the Trinity. Uh, first of all, when uh, apparently in Surah 5 verse 116, it talks about uh, Allah, Jesus, and Mary as it would seem to be the three persons of the Trinity, this certainly is not talking about a Orthodox Christian understanding. It says, O Jesus, son of Mary, didst thou say uh, unto mankind, take me and my mother for two gods besides Allah? Furthermore, when the Quran in Surah 4 verses 169 or 171, depending on your translation, uh, says, say not three, uh, I, if we are thinking of three gods. Uh, the Christians don't believe in uh, three gods. So that would seem to be uh, very possibly a rejection of tritheism or the belief in three gods, which uh, Christians do not uh, believe in. Now, when we come to uh, how do we understand or how might we explain to the extent that we can explain uh, how God can be one and yet express himself uh, through three persons or in three ways. Uh, let's indicate what the concept of the Trinity does for the Christian. Uh, the Christian, like the Muslim, is very interested in worshiping God aright. And to worship God aright, there is the need to understand him uh, rightly. And uh, we feel that we can understand him uh, as he has revealed himself through a person rather than just revealing his will uh, through a law. Furthermore, uh, the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13, Jesus says the spirit of truth is coming. When he comes, he will lead you into all truth. And so the function of the Holy Spirit, again, is to help us understand God better so that we can worship him better, the very thing that both Christians and Muslims want to do. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to look at experience in the lives of the uh, disciples. Uh, they sit, certainly did not sit down as philosophers and try to work out as philosophers or theologians in the Hellenic or Greek world of a later date uh, how God could be one in three, but they experienced living with a man, Jesus Christ, who was a man, and they knew at the end of this time that somehow God was in Christ. And uh, they experienced a power after the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God came upon them that could only be ex explained as a divine uh, power. See, we're talking about unity, but uh, there are various kinds of unity, and the higher the form, the more complex. For example, there's a unity in plant life, in uh, animal life, in human life, and is it not... Uh, logical to expect that in God, the highest form of all life, there would be even a more complex form of unity. Uh, now, the medieval theologians in Islam, when they did not understand something about God, they often said, we believe it, and then used the term bilakaif, literally without how. Uh, and so in both our faiths, there are many things that we don't fully uh, understand. But let me just suggest uh, a model in the Quran 
uh, or certain lines of thought that might make it more easy to understand a Christian view of how God can be three in one. Uh, I don't think Muslims would have uh, trouble thinking of God as a spirit because they certainly do not want to think of him in material terms. And then the Quran in Surah 4, verse 171 or 169, depending on your translation, says, uh, Jesus is a spirit from God. Now, I'm not saying that it means the same thing as Christians would understand here. Yet nevertheless, in some way, God so breathed of his spirit into Mary and upon Christ or into Christ that he could be called a spirit from uh, God. And then although the Quran in different places seems to mean different things by uh, spirit, certainly in many places it is of a being higher than the angels that is personal. Uh, this is what uh, your early commentators, uh, Muslim commentators on the Quran, uh, would say. And so you have verses like Surah 16, verse 102 or 104, depending on your translation, which says, the Holy Spirit was made to descend from his Lord. Well, if we think of God as a spirit, and a spirit can be in different places, I think it helps us to see uh, the relationship that we have uh, in scripture between a father, a son, and a Holy Spirit, which is not to be thought in anthropomorphic terms, uh, that is in human terms, but in relational terms. And I think I've used my 10 minutes. Well, so, thank you very uh, much. Would it be appropriate for my side to add anything at this time? Yeah, or, sure. Would, uh, detract anything? <laughs> would you like to add anything, any of the uh, members of the panel, please? Well, I guess I would only say one thing that... Could you get the mic closer to you? Okay. Yeah. I think there are a couple of places, and I would just take one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, where... Okay. I will take one place from the Old Testament and one from the New, where, in a sense, I think God is giving us an answer to this question. What is God like in the, uh, in the Christian view? And in the Old Testament, you get a very lovely and beautiful picture. It talks about the creation. And God is with Adam and Eve, and he comes down into the garden, and as, as it were, he holds hands with them. He wants to relate to them. He walks with them, enjoys the creation that he has made, and he is in close fellowship. And what grieves him is when Adam sins, and then uh, he hides himself. And basically, this is the problem of all Muslims and Christians. Ultimately, we have a, a gulf or a gap between us and God. And there is some sense in which our sin has turned us away from God. Now, that is a picture where God is the one who comes down and holds hands with us and wants to have fellowship with us in the cool of the evening. Then there's another picture in the New Testament. In Luke 15, it tells a story where you have a father who uh, permits his son, or one of his sons, to take away the wealth or his inheritance and go off and waste it on, uh, in evil and, and with his friends and as far as he can get from the father. And what is the response of the father? Does he hate the son, you ingrate? Does he respond to the son as one who uh, is unworthy to come back into the house? Or when the son runs out of fr friends and runs out of money, which happens at the same time as usual, then we find the son coming back, sensing he is unworthy. And does the father receive the son? The father is, as it were, waiting on tippy toes for that son to come back. And then when the son comes back, he embraces him. Now these, I think, are two pictures that tell us a bit of what God is like in the Christian view. Well, thank you. <clears throat> you like that. Maybe just, just two, two quick comments. One is in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Our Father in heaven. And for us, both of those phrases are very important. The Father image suggests relationship suggests love, nearness, many things to us. But it's also in heaven, so there is the sovereignty, the greatness, the power, the majesty of God. 
Um, that even the, in a sense, the Lord's Prayer, the first phrase reminds us of two very important aspects of God. And a second quick comment is that many Muslims have wondered why in the New Testament there isn't more emphasis on the oneness of God. And I think at stake there was not so much the oneness of God because the Jewish community already believed in the oneness of God. That was not at stake. It was not a question of paganism, of many gods. At stake was the question of the sovereignty of God. So what if you believe that there is one God? Allah Ahad, la ilaha illallah. So what? What difference does it make in the society, in the human community itself? Even the devil believes in the oneness of God. So at, at stake, really, was not so much, you know, the unity of God, but the sovereignty of God and how that was to manifest and uh, show itself. الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الفرد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وأصلي وأسلم على رسول محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى سائر الأنبياء والمرسلين وحييكم and I greet you all with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah be with you. I'd like to start with three very quick preliminary observations. One is that uh, this kind of dialogue is on a totally different level. <coughs> and that means to me two thing, three things. One is that we can delve directly in the topic, as we did and we are doing now. Secondly, that we can afford to present things in a very brief and capsulized way, leaving the rest for the discussion. Thirdly, we can be more frank and candid and make the presentation in a comparative way so that we can quickly come to points of understanding. And I do expect from my colleagues, both on the Muslim side and the Christian side, uh, to uh, feel free to challenge whatever is being said because my approach in this and several other topics would be to look at the areas of commonality and discuss also the areas of difference. And it's quite conceivable that someone may say, hey, you think that this is an area of similarity? It's not. Or you did not mention a very major and crucial area of difference. So this is just a preliminary discussion starter. To apply that approach then, my first question, where do we meet as Muslims and Christians? I would summarize that in 10 points. I run them through them very quickly. One is the reality of God. God is not an imagination, is not a myth, uh, is not an entity created in man's own image. Two, Allah and the universe are not one and the same. So there is the separateness, even though we can speak also about eminence, immanence of God, but God and the universe are not equal, and as such, there is nothing like hululiyah or pantheism in either religions. Three, God is not a mere concept or philosophy. That's why I wasn't too comfortable even with the topic concept of God. God is not a concept, maybe conception, our conception about God. God is not a concept or dry idea. Uh, God is a is living God. He interacts with us. We interact with him. There is a mutuality of response throughout history. Four, God loves us and cares for us and is ready to forgive us. We have only to seek his ample mercy and grace which is available. Five, God also requires us to show some mutuality in that expression of love through faith in him and good deeds. And as such, as Professor Vogler said, to show, not just to say that there is one God, but to show that also in society and in action. Number six, our obedience to God is for our own benefit because he doesn't need us. Allah is a samad. A samad means the one on whom everyone depends, but he does not depend on anyone. And in the meantime, our disobedience to him hurts us. It doesn't hurt him. So it's our for own benefit. Seven, rebellion against God without repentance has its own negative consequences in this life or the hereafter or both. Not because God is a vengeful God who loves to torment and punish people, but as the Quran says, 
what would God do with punishing you if you are simply grateful and have faith in him? But we cannot say that rebellion and obedience are to be equated. Each one has its own uh, consequences. Number eight, in my understanding also in both communities, we admit that we cannot fully understand everything about God or his actions and wisdom in history and in the universe. Yet we have complete faith in him, in his justice, and his mercy. And, but in the meantime, we also believe that God does not want us to accept something that can be proven false, that is self-contradictory or impossible. He may ask us to believe in something that is beyond our grasp, but not self-contradictory uh, propositions. And that means also that when God communicates to us, he communicates in a language that we can understand, which cannot convey the true meaning. And as such, it is an analogical wording that we have to be quite careful how we read it and not to be too literal unnecessarily. Number nine, <clears throat> I believe there is agreement between the two communities on the fundamental attributes of God. I'll just mention a dozen very quickly supremacy, creation, uh, eternity, omnipresence, uh, being um, omnipotent, uh, being uh, omniscient, transcendence of God, holiness, al-Quddus, justice, righteousness, uh, al-Barr, uh, love, compassion, forgiveness. You can go on and on, and I believe these are commonly shared attributes. Number 10 that Allah or God is one, at least in the sense that neither community believe in dualism, tritheism, or polytheism. There's no question about that. Any uh, learned Muslim should know that. But this last point I didn't put last even though it's the most important because it's least. It is the most important, but paradoxically speaking, it is an area of similarity, but it is an area also that relates to a fundamental area of difference, and that moves me to the issue of difference. Where do we differ? Now, the basic difference is that in my understanding, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting the Christian faith by any means, is that our Christian brethren claim that God chose to enter history in a given time 2,000 years ago in a decisive way by becoming a man and dwelling among us having a fellowship with us. And through the Christ event, particularly the crucifixion and resurrection, we are, we are giving the formula for overcoming sin. I hope that this is an honest summary. A Muslim would respond to that basically by saying, no, God did not become man, but the man Jesus Christ, the human being, the prophet, was made God but through human philosophy and theology. I believe that this issue and the issues related to Trinity, especially some of the points made by Dr. Woodbury, I'd like to comment on, but I feel that the topic fits here and fits also in the discussion on is Jesus God, so I'd like to reserve some of this for later times as well. But what I'd like to address here in the remaining minutes is to explain the essence of that difference by explaining what Tawheed in Islam means. The word Tawheed has been imperfectly translated as monotheism. But this is not the way the Muslim understand it, and the term Tawheed is much more comprehensive than the term monotheism. To explain that, we can say that there are three essential conditions for Tawheed. One is Wahdat al uluhiyya which means unity of lordship. That means God alone is the sole creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe, and all in between. And I believe that point is a point of agreement, not only with the Christian faith, but with Jews and maybe other world religions. Even the pagan Arabs before Islam did not deny that there is only one creator of all the universe. The second condition is Wahdat al rububiyya which means that since God is the sole creator and sustainer of the universe, then he alone is the one who is worthy of worship and devotion, which means that none is to be worshipped instead of him, alongside with him, nor is God to be worshipped through any of his creatures, Jesus, Abraham, Muhammad, or anyone else. And I believe that this could be an area, perhaps, of difference. In fact, as the Quran says, say, O Muhammad, 
قل إن كان للرحمن ولد فأنا أول العابدين say oh Muhammad if it were true that God had a son I would be the first to worship and then it continues سبحانه وتعالى عما يشركون may glory be to God from what they associate with him the third aspect of Tawheed which is very crucial is the unity of you might say the essence and attributes of God that God is one in person that there is no persons in the one Godhood which requires that God is to be described with all perfection to be free from all deficiencies that there is no parts within Godhood but there is also no persons in that Godhood whether it is called a Trinity or triunity even that has been negated in the Quran not only the uh, streams that has been rejected by the Christian faith Muslims accept the attributes of God not only as three and there is no reason to stop at three but 99 but these are taken as attributes but not persons one quick word before I finish is the issue of shirk any deficiency in the conditions of Tawheed is regarded in Islam as shirk shirk literally means to associate with or to join with and this has been mistakenly translated in some Christian literature as polytheism. No, shirk includes polytheism, but not restricted to that. It does include any deficiency in the condition, which means Trinity also would be, according to Muslim theology, part of the broader concept of uh, shirk. To conclude, the question of shirk is very serious in the Quran. And it says in the Quran that God w is willing to forgive anything, but he will never forgive that, that anyone associate others with him, that means in his exclusive divine attributes such as eternity or creation or acting as judge. In fact, it quotes Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, as warning the children of Israel that they should worship God, their Lord, and his Lord, and that anyone who associates others with God, God will forbid paradise to him. So to conclude then, Muslims feel that they are the restorers of the true monotheism taught by all of the prophets, including Jesus, peace be upon him. Thank you. Any of the other? You want to add something? Can I add something? Yeah, sure. This isn't working. It is working. <laughs> I just wanted to add a couple of points. Uh, I noticed the speaker said that the, at one point that the Quran is, seems to be condemning tritheism. The, confusing the idea of Trinity with the belief of uh, belief in uh, there being three gods. And also it seemed to confuse the Trinity with the belief that God and Mary and Jesus uh, made up the Trinity. And that uh, this seems to be the Quran or Prophet Muhammad's intention. Uh, I read it differently. Let me just refer to a couple of statements uh, very quickly. The Quran does strongly denounce certain doctrinal statements of Christianity. It rejects, and certain doctrinal statements of Judaism as well, or certain uh, types of statements. It rejects, for example, the use of Jews and Christians of the phrase, son of God, even though they used them in a different sense. For example, in one verse, the Quran says, the Jews say that Uzer is the son of God, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of God. Then goes on to say that this is the saying from their mouth. In this they but imitate the deniers of truth of all, what the deniers of truth or the ungrateful or the rejectors of truth used to say of old. It singles out Christianity in particular for formulating the concept of uh, Christianity for formulating the concept of Trinity. It says, don't say three, desist, it'll be better for you. For God is one, glory be to him above having a son. And it also criticizes very strongly the widespread uh, practice among some major Christian sects of worshiping Jesus and his mother Mary. It says, and behold, God will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto mankind, worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of God? He will say, glory be to you. Never could I say what I had no right. Had I said such a thing, you would indeed have known it. Now, th these were the th three uh, verses, I think, that were addressed. Uh, now, it very well be that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had little personal knowledge of these enigmatic tenets. But the conclusions that the Quran is assuming that the Christians uh, believe in a certain type of tritheism, or that Mary and Jesus and uh, God made up the Trinity, is only an interpretation, a conjecture, and it's very difficult to prove based on the Quran itself. 
It's quite obvious from the text that the issue for the Quran, and the Quran is very pragmatic. As Dr. Jamal Bedoui said, and some of our Christian friends have said, Revelation isn't there to reveal all there is to know about God. But from the Quranic standpoint, it's there to guide us to correct worship of God and towards spiritual growth. The problem for the Quran and these statesmen is clearly with the wordings. Thus it stresses the Jews say, the Christians say, and don't say in the above verses I quoted. Because these expressions in the words of the Quran imitate, they imitate idol worship. And, we, and it would be better to avoid such language. Even, in the t if, uh, even though the two religions use the expression son of God in different ways and in different senses, they are warned of the inherent dangers in the words. This is the Quran's approach towards religion. It's very pragmatic, very practical. The fact that the Quran does not substitute they believe for they say in these references argues for an awareness on the part of the Quran that the symbols are open to a range of theological interpretations. Thus we find other passages that include some Christians and Jews as true believers in God. I'll just finish up now because Hamid's have to finish. All right. The Quran is not so much concerned here with theological postulates as it is with the effect of these formulations on the common man. For the common Jew may come to believe in the Jewish sense of understanding the word son of God that the Jews to the exclusion of all others are God's beloved people. And the average Christian could very easily mislead, misread these doctrinal statements and conclude or understand that Jesus is God or the begotten Son of God in some literal sense, and even that his mother should be objects of prayer and worship. To this day, if you ask any Christian if Jesus is literally God's Son and if he should be worshipped, he's more than likely to respond in the affirmative. And Christians are likely to say, or Catholics, the same about Mary, that Mary is the mother of God, and they pray to him, oh, Mary, mother of God. Thus, these references, uh, especially the one to the Trinity, uh, are aware of this very real hazard. That the Quran's concern is with the misleading character of the above-mentioned doctrinal phrases is further evidence, this is my last sentence, by its own references to Jesus as a Messiah, a spirit, and a word from God. In effect, indicating that these descriptions used by Christians are acceptable, yet not exclusive to Jesus. But really, I think we're mis misreading the point. The Quran is very concerned with the danger of these doctrinal statements formulated by men, because they could mislead their communities away from submission to God. This seems to be a very big concern. I just wanted to uh, emphasize that point. Sorry I took so long. Thank you. Well, we'll try to talk. Can you hear me at the back? You hear me all right? I think everybody has the same level as me, so. Huh? Well, as long as you can communicate with me, the rest can do the same thing without uh, needing to use the, this mic anyhow. Uh, we finished this, uh, this, por this portion now. They might want to uh, respond. Uh, we'll have to... You have to forgive me because we're running out of time, but I will let you talk if you have any comment to make, and then we'll move to the second part. Sorry, I kind of uh, was taken away by the time. Would you like to add any? The only comment that I would like to make in regard to the Trinity and with all the philosophical... Can, can you speak aloud? Sure. With all, all the philosophical points that we can add, in regard to the definition of the Trinity, the fact remains that Jesus, peace be upon him, never taught Trinity. Jesus, peace be upon him, never mentioned anything about three divine persons combined in one Godhead. The doctor of Trinity was established by Father Athanasius and the Council of Nicaea 325 years after Jesus. And the Athanasius Creed reads, there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. These are the words of Father Athanasius. These are not the words of Jesus, peace be upon him. Thank you. You want to add anything? Shaka? 
Okay, good. That's what I want to get to. So, can we start with uh, Let me your just mention uh, two verses. Do we need to speak into the mic here? Yes, please, for the recording. Right. Uh, let me just uh, mention two verses which uh, would show that Jesus uh, was talking in terms of three centers of consciousness. Uh, Athanasius was not uh, putting together, uh, making something up in his own mind 300 years later. Uh, in Matthew 28, 19, uh, the disciples are told to baptize, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in John 14, 16, Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another counselor, comforter, so that uh, certainly whether or not we agree with the way that the Greek mind uh, tried to put these facts together, uh, our Lord was talking to someone that he called Father and talking about a, a spirit that had among his functions the function of being a comforter. Before we move, do you have any comment here? We'll move back to you. Okay. Let me get What? Oh, that's okay. That's we'll just uh, take one here, one, one comment here, one comment here, and maybe we can change it later or so. That's what we're doing now. He, he made a comment, and uh, Dr. Woodbury made a comment, and then Dr. Jamal Badr will make a comment. Okay, I have quite a few, but I'll, again, in, in terms of time, I'll take almost equal time also. <coughs> Just since the, uh, Dr. Woodbury mentioned that, and that's fresh in our minds, about the baptismal formula, according to a new Catholic encyclopedia, they say that this formula is not known as to whether this actually were the word of Jesus or were a, another earlier baptismal formula. So again, the question of and that will come, of course, in the question of the Bible and the uh, discussion of the author authority and authenticity. But even if you take it when it says, uh, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, it didn't say which are one. And I think there could be a major difference there. Uh, the uh, John 14, 16 about the uh, comforter or paracletus that uh, he will, will come down. I think there have been other interpretations, other legitimate interpretation some of the early Christians even believed that the Paracletus is a person, not a spirit. And there have been people already who claim to be Paracletus throughout history, and Muslim would claim actually that this Paracletus is a reference to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Of course, that's a big topic, but maybe you can discuss that also. Is Prophet Muhammad a prophet? So I'm just making a quick. My third quick point also, uh, Dr. Woodbury mentioned earlier that uh, we Muslims and Christians believe in the same attributes of God, but we emphasize different ones. Muslims or uh, classical theologians emphasizing the might and transcendence of God, while as Christian emphasize love. Uh, I would say that uh, it is not a difference between Islam and Christianity, but it may be a difference within the religious community. Because when you look at the Sufis, for example, I'm not talking about diverted Sufis or people who went too, too far. True Sufism that is in line with the Quran and Sunnah actually emphasize so much of the love of God than the might of God as was reported by a lady Muslim saint, Rabi'a al adawiyya when she said, Oh God, if I am worshipping you only because of your paradise, forbid that paradise to me. If I am worshipping you only because of the fear of the hellfire, burn me more in that hellfire. And if I am worshipping you only out of the love of thee and the aspiration to enjoy the bliss of your presence in the hereafter, then deprive me not of that privilege. In fact, in Muslim daily life, the five daily prayers, it's nothing but the expression of that outpouring of love and re direct and personal relationship with God. If we go beyond the formalism, which is not the essence, the same applied to fasting, charity, and others. So I don't think there is really uh, a relative emphasis. I don't think this is the case in Islam, and I hope also in Christianity, at least among some, there is some degree of balance between both. Hello. My comment had to do rather with the, well, my uh, comment would go on to the Quran itself, uh, where I see in the Bible a love of God for those who are unlovely, whereas uh, even Daud Rahbar, under whom I studied when he was still a Muslim, he later on became a Christian, but in his book, uh, God of Justice, 
where he as a Muslim was studying the Quran, uh, he, in his study of the Quran, said God in the Quran only loves those who love him. He does not love those who uh, do not love him. And I could give many verses, but the passage I referred to uh, would, I think, express this. Uh, if you love God, follow me. God will love you and forgive your sins. But if you turn your back, God loves not the disbelievers or uh, ungrateful. So uh, that was the purpose of my okay. point. Before, to before you move, this. Dr. Jamal Bado, would you like to, sh do you share him the same opinion? Would you like to add any point to the same point? Like a, okay, to the same uh, point, please. No, I, I wanted then to let's let's Jen fin finish this point. point. Trinity, may I speak to that? No, we we now talking about God loves those who love Him. So this is the point we're dealing with right now. I'd okay. I'd like to respond to that actually because this was on okay. my list also of points. In fact, the ayah has nothing to do with saying that lo God loves only those who love Him. It, the context of the ayah is quite different. The context of the ayah is to provide an acid test for devotion to God. Because it says, say, O Muhammad, to people, if you truly love God, show it. That is, follow me, God will love you more and forgive your sins. On the other hand, the opposite of that, if you want to rebel against God, if they turn their back away, reject that grace of God, then it says, we did not send you, O Muhammad, as a guardian over them. So it has nothing to do with the question of God only loving those who love him, because indeed, as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, indicates, he says, if this whole world is worth even a wing of a fly in the sight of God, he would have not given a drink of water to unbeliever, which means that even the unbeliever, God cares for him. God cares for him, he provides for him, and still give him or her ample opportunities and chances to turn back to him. So that notion interpreted by uh, Mr. Rahbar, it is his interpretation. It's not the understanding of Muslim. It's not okay. the context of the Quran. We, Just a second. We, we're, getting, we're getting heated, so that's, yeah. that's good. It's, uh, it's getting better. We've got ample hot, uh, it's getting better. Uh, one, Shakir, and then uh, same point, please. We'll, same we'll point. move. Same point. We'll come back to you. It okay. is about the same oh. point. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Woodbury, uh, I will speak of the other side. Even point. though you kept repeating that the Quran emphasizes that God speak aloud please that God only loves those who love him but there is no one single verse to translate into that particular statement not to my memory and I do memorize the Quran and I do read it daily but there is one thing I would like to share with you and I would like an interaction here if God sends somebody to hellfire does he send them to hellfire out of love out of compassion? I want your answer. I don't know. <laughs> okay. In I don't your know religion, you in Christianity, does God have a hellfire? Yes, he does. According to the Bible, and I read here Matthew 5 29, Matthew 18 7, Mark 9 43, Matthew 13 41, 13 42, 13 48, 49, 50. Mark 9, 44, Luke 12, 49, Luke 13, 3 and 5. In all of these verses, there is a great deal of mention of people being sent to hellfire, sent to hellfire. Mm -hmm. Is this out of love to the disbelievers? Can I answer? Yeah, would you please? Uh, we have to back up. God made provision before that person did go to hellfire for him to be delivered from that. And then there's another fact I, I think that you need to notice that man's response cannot really change the essential nature of God. If God was ever love at all, what a person does in his response is not going to change the essential nature of God. And in Christianity, God is love. But in Islam, the basic seven attributes of God, which have historically been recognized by Muslims, and I, I presume you accept them too, or as stated by al-Nasafi in his Creed on God, it says, he has qualities from all eternity existing in his essence. They are not he, nor are they other than he. Now, then it gives the list. Here, are the, They are knowledge and power and life and strength and hearing and seeing and doing and creating and sustaining and speech. Now, Love could have been stressed in that. This is a Muslim speaking, not a Christian. 
he gives things that are very good things but he does not stress in the same way that Christianity does that God is love if I, if I may answer that please no no it was my turn, it is my turn. <laughs> okay. I, uh, can I suggest that maybe we should have uh, a strict team leader I believe and it was either he speaks or give to one of his teams I think that would make it uh, uh, more organized I think we, we will just allow everybody to talk provided you just Help us uh, do this program, <coughs> Jeffrey. Lang. I, I uh, <coughs> tend uh, have a s uh, slightly agree with the other side in a certain sense, uh, in the sense that the Quran, when it talks about love uh, between God and uh, uh, human, it does s sort of speak of a reciprocating relationship, uh, giving and uh, receiving, reciprocating sort of relationship. So God loves the believers and the believers love God. Uh, it emphasizes this. It doesn't say God loves only the believers, but I think it does emphasize that point, and I, I have a tend to have to uh, say that's true. The Quran talks about another type of love, though, which God gives and encompasses all things, and this is very, comes out very clearly in the prophetic hadiths, is that God's mercy is one of his m often most mentioned uh, qualities in the attributes in the Quran, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. They're two of the most mentioned. They appear hundreds of times in the Quran. And this is the way the Muslim pictures God in his faith. He sees God's mercy embracing all things and above all things. But the relationship that the human has with God, this reciprocating and give and take relationship between a believer and God, is, uh, uh, is love. So, you know, the point of it is, is that the Quran is not going to tell the kafir, the disbeliever, that God loves you. Because he's trying to save his soul, to direct him to submission to God and to surrender to God. Because that is what his salvation depends. So he doesn't want to mislead him away from that. He promises that his mercy extends over all things. And the Muslim concept of mercy is something that's given like a mother gives mercy, with expecting nothing in return. But, so so you're, this you're talking is, uh, about mercy. Yes, yeah, oh, so it's thank the you. concept of mercy in Islam includes this love given freely. Okay. The restricted sense of love to a give and take relationship, I believe the Quran does stress that between the believer and okay. uh, God. Thank you. Uh, I think we should also give them a chance. To, go ahead. Yeah, go let ahead. me just, uh, because uh, the statement was said that uh, nowhere in the Quran does uh, God, does God not love right. certain people. And uh, just this one verse was exegeted. Uh, and I, uh, I fully admit and appreciate the fact that most of the surahs of the Quran start out with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, rah, 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 in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. But uh, you have many verses like this. Uh, God does not love those who transgress, Surah 5, verse 87. Yes. He does not love the unjust, Surah 3, oh, verse right. 140. And both, there are many examples that could be given of both of these. He does not love those who disbelieve, Surah 30, verse 45. Yes. So uh, my, my question, you know, I... Yes, his mercy embraces all is things. a different but that, stress. Yes. But that, that very special the, reciprocating the love, Testament. that highest form of love, exists right. between <coughs> the believer Did and you God. Want to say something on that? Okay, just a second. Okay. okay. Let's finish this point quickly, wrap it up, and then we'll move to the other point, uh, Dr. Dr. Vagular, you had something to say? <laughs> we'll come back yeah. to you. <laughs> I would say on this that uh, within the Christian community, we've had a lot of. Uh, debates, internal debates, on many of these same issues. And... Um, still are. <laughs> yeah, still are. That, in a sense, we, we some of us have spoken of uh, double predestination. Uh, some are predestined to heaven and some are predestined to hell. In other words, those that go to hell, uh, this sort of solves that problem. They, they were destined for that. Uh, many in the Christian church didn't exactly appreciate it. It preserved the sovereignty of God, for sure. God was uh, ruling over all. Then there is the other side, which would be sort of universalist. God wills that everyone be saved. And in fact, finally, everyone will be saved. Okay. Ultimately, you cannot say no to the love of God. 
Uh, this is also something that appeals deeply, I think, to scripture and also to something very deep within us that God's will, God's mercy will somehow ultimately prevail and everyone will uh, be saved. That also creates certain problems. Then we had what we call Pelagian, uh, who believed that yes, God wills to save all, God wants to save all, but it still depends on man to respond. Right. Man needs to initiate and God will respond. Man needs to have faith, God will you know, answer this. Um, the church finally said that Pelagianism is, is a heresy because in a sense it finally perhaps makes man in control of his own destiny. It says that man has truly the freedom to respond or not to respond. Man is, in a sense, even more powerful over his own destiny than God himself. And uh, that may be all right in certain circumstances, but that finally, if you play that out, it becomes very dangerous and has many ramifications that, you know, man is not the measure of all things. In a deeper sense, man is not really free to choose. There is a sense in which we don't have the freedom within ourselves. We are not truly free individuals to make a choice about our own destiny. There are so many factors involved that we don't even know about that somehow what I think the Christian church has finally come to say is that God himself needs to set us free. You see, it's not that we are free, but that God in his mercy, in his love, in his grace, through his prophets, he, he takes the initiative. He must set us free. God must set us free. And then, in a sense, we, we respond or we are open <clears throat> to him. So we have the images of the, of the good shepherd, right? Just to remind you. Yeah, the, the good shepherd going out. He leaves the ninety and nine and goes out after the one. Now that's, in, in other words, God's love, God's mercy initiates the action. And it's not so much us then that have the freedom to, to call for God's mercy or his anger. Thank you, Dr. Vagla. I think we should wrap this point up and uh, okay. move to the other point. Sure. So this is the last, we, we're not going to, you know. Uh, a, good, a reference was made earlier to more. one of the Muslim writers who in a given context mentioned seven of the paramount, what he considered to be paramount attributes of God. But Muslims are not obliged to accept one particular opinion or one particular expose. The reference for Muslim is the Quran. The Quran speaks about 99, not 7, 99. So the author was dealing with certain aspects in a certain context. So that should not be an argument really against Islam as such. And as Dr. Woodbury mentioned earlier, one of the most beautiful names of God in the Quran, Al-Wadud. To me, that's better than saying God is love. Because God is love is a very ambiguous statement. Al-Wadud actually has been translated correctly by Yusuf Ali as one who is uh, most intense in loving compassion. So this uh, actually is an issue which is uh, quite clear in terms of the expression of the Quran. The second thing, uh, the references that, that Dr. Woodbury made to the Quran that Allah loves pious people, Allah doesn't love evil doers. It doesn't mean God doesn't care about them, but this is only the logical thing to do. Uh, or else do we expect the Quran to say God love evil doers? So somebody says, if God loves me because of that, I'm, I'm going to do some more, some more evil. No, obviously. So the context in which the Quran says God loves those who do good, who are charitable, who are pious, who are kind to others, the purpose behind it is to stress the importance of those acts, good acts, so that the person would do it to achieve that divine love. And when the Quran says Allah does not love this, does not love that, does not love this kind of behavior, actually it refers to the behavior really, right. rather than saying he doesn't care about the person. As far as caring for people, as the Prophet Sallallahu once explained when he looked at a woman carrying her baby very compassionately, he said God is more loving and caring for you than this woman love for her own child. And final, one final remark. We should not get to, into this sometimes area of uh, statistical calculation. How many times the word love appeared in the Quran? That would be rather a surface way, really, of looking at it. Because love is not a slogan in the Quran, as Dr. Woodbury indicated. 
Each and every ayah begins with the attribute of mercy of Allah, not might, not paramount uh, omnipresent, omnipresence and omniscient. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, most compassionate, most graceful. With this kind of, and that appears in 113 out of 114. If you add the other ayat in the Quran that takes this attribute of mercy of Allah, which is connected to love, organically connected to love, you get more than 260 places. In fact, one of these attributes that the Quran describes connecting with love, al ghafurul wadud, that God is forgiving and most intense in his loving compassion, which means that the fact that Islam say that God is willing to forgive without bloodshed actually is a manifestation of that divine love. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Okay, you have one more comment f for this side. One of you can make it, you or Dr. Morsi. We'll have to move to the another point. Thank you. Go ahead, Chase. Uh, my comment here is uh, just I have to read some of the verses I got here in the Bible. I'm quoting uh, Matthew uh, 13 41, where Jesus gave the parable and the example of God, like a man who has a net. He threw the net in the sea to fish. He got in the net fish that is good and fish that is bad. He will take the good and he will throw away what is bad. That example is given in the Bible. Does he love the bad? Why does he throw it away? Not only that, but it goes on on Mark 9:44, where Jesus said, if your hand uh, gives you uh, sin and pain, then better cut it and be maimed rather than, uh, and better cut it and be maimed and get to the paradise rather than going with two hands to hell that is unquenchable. Hell that is unquenchable. Uh, does this mean love to the sinner? Does this mean love to the sinner? Yeah. Is he's asking a question, I presume. Yes, yes. I'm one. making so, a comment so and a question. Uh, you, you're giving me a hard time. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> So I, I would like really to move to so another point. I mean, you know, we got uh, we discussed the concept of God. So. Can we answer this? My well, comment they, might have some relation. Yes, right. please. Go ahead, Dr. Batson. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't uh, accept the proposal that uh, word is associated only with Jesus. I have already quoted, and I can refer you to more verses in the Quran where the word is used in plural. And yes. even when it occurs, it says, بِكَلِمَةٍ minhu, A word from him, not of him. From him, not of him. And that's also significant. The fact that Jesus was mentioned in that, name, in that particular context, because it, it suited the context. Here is a promise that was given to Mary before even uh, she got pre you know, the pregnancy with Jesus, peace be upon him. So that was suitable. The fact that he was created according to the Quran with the command of God, direct command B, as a created a human being, is also suitable to say that he was created by the command of God. And you have to interpret the Quran within the physiology of the Quran. And the word kun in the Quran appears more than once as the creative command of God. So I, I don't see how can we say that according to the Quran, it is only restricted to that. Number one. Number two. <coughs> The uh, question that Dr. Martinson raised about the argument that went on at one point of time about whether the Quran is created, muhdas or qadim, you know, old or, or uh, made, I think uh, uh, while it did take place, in fact, for the, if you take the history of the 1400 years of history of Islam, you find that this was a minor point and even the Muslim uh, scholars and historians refer to it as fitna at khalq al-Quran, fitna that it was a frivolous question really that should have not been raised in the first place because it seemed to have followed the steps of philosophers and theologians in spite of the fact that the Quran is very simple and very clear to the point. And in fact, in one sense, you could say that the question is neither or really. You can say, all right, the word of the Quran representing the knowledge of God and his wisdom is eternal with God. There is no question. But the Quran as book written on ink is muhdas. In other words, the papers themselves are made. So that was a very minor issue. I understand, of course, uh, the m issue might have been to some degree settled in Christianity, but I think it was a very heated issue and lies at the heart of theology itself rather than as whether the book of God or the word of God is created or uh, muhdas. That's not relevant uh, 
uh, in Islamic context. One final point on this is the uh, point also raised earlier about uh, God that has to be understood also by us or else it becomes rather abstract. In that, I believe uh, Muslims distinguish between the essence of God and the attribute of God that he told us about. As far as the essence or nature, even though I know the word essence or nature is again a loose term, we're using analogical language again. When you talk about the essence of God, it is impossible uh, that either a Christian or Muslim would totally comprehend. Because if we were to comprehend the essence of God, we might as well be gods ourselves. And the Quran is quite clear on that. لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار. Vision comprehends him not, but he comprehends all. ليس كمثله شيء. There is absolutely nothing comparable unto him. Physical in the word of thought. Again, it doesn't mean that he is not eminent. That is just abstract or high. But it means basically that we should not waste our time trying to say what is the essence of God? What does he look like? Would it be easier for us if we see him manifest in flesh? No, the relative issue, the, the, the most important issue is really to learn about the attributes of God as a reflection. But again, the word reflection is not a very accurate one <coughs> as a sort of proxy that give us some indication about God. But uh, comprehending the essence of God is, is totally out of question, really. I have a question, please. Are these, is, is mercy a reliable characterization of, characterization of God? Or might God, if we were to know his nature, which is beyond us, if we were to know that nature, would God be different than the God who is mercy? I think that's what the Christian is concerned about when we say use the word nature and self-disclosure. It's not an interest in some kind of metaphysical substance or essence, but it is uh, how serious is this attribute of God, God's mercy? Does it characterize the reality of God and God will never be other than this which is mercy? So the attribute uh, speaks of the nature of God. You see, so it penetrates into it somehow. <coughs> That's what we're interested in. In that non-incarnational sense, I have no difficulty with that as well. Well, then, of course, Proxy, we have we not, have not the reality, so. we we have to go on to, from a Christian perspective. Um, uh, it does have incarnational implications. Uh, the um, the way God relates to the world um, is is uh, is a profound relationship and the most profound way of relating to anybody as we are doing here tonight is not just speaking you know we could we could put boards in front of us and then speak from behind these boards and not relate to each other but we had a supper we are together it's person to person where relationship is at its deepest and its richest so in the understanding of God for the Christian, it penetrates to that level of uh, that love, mercy, is a relational, uh, a, a relational kind of thing. Yeah, and that's the area both of similarity mm -hmm. and difference. Because again, the Muslim would say that's the same kind of feeling also in terms of uh, tawhid being a relationship, not just an abstract yes. philosophical concept. Yeah. But again, the Muslim doesn't see necessity for that incarnation because mm -hmm. the love, the relationship with God could be achieved at the highest level without resort to that issue of incarnation. So that perhaps would be the deciding yeah. or the yeah. divine point. I have a question, please. Okay. Let, let us see and get uh, Shaka. I will add just a little point and give him a okay. okay. See, the, the point about the manifestation of God or touching him and seeing him that may influence the type of relationship and love and make it more affectionate or more realistic or more in existence, so to speak. Isn't this some sort of like a contradiction to the fact that a believer, like Jesus said, uh, blessed are those who believed but see so not. Those who did not see but believed. 
the idea of faith in itself is that we believe in the unseen. This is one article of faith for Muslims. We believe in God. God is someone that nobody saw by his naked eyes or by a telescope or any other means. We believe in the hereafter. Nobody lived it. Nobody saw it. But we believe. It's conveyed to us through prophets. We believe in it. And uh, the love of knowing God while not seeing God, as Jesus himself described, is much more than one uh, who only believes after he sees or loves after he sees, so to speak. I think that uh, Muslims do believe in the unseen in the most abstract way, yet the closest of faith and the strongest of faith. I think Christians also do believe in the unseen. I think that Christians also do believe in the hereafter. They believe in hell, in heaven, in life after death. They believe in the unseen. Uh, that doesn't make them uh, uh, like it less or more to see it or not to see it. It is a matter of what repercussions and impact does it have on our behavior as human, our relationship to this God that we did not see, to this life that we never lived, and to what happens after death. Uh, this relationship is established on basis of understanding the faith. And then once we believe, uh, it carries on to love and mercy. Okay. Uh, I think we have to make a distinction between what did the prophets themselves taught us and told us and what philosophers <coughs> argue and philosophical discussions. Uh, first of all, God creates by his will and he does not incarnate. Second, the argument about the Mu'tazila, about whether the Quran was created or uncreated, like Dr. Bada we had pointed out, this was part of history, and this is not an article of faith. It's not a requirement for the Muslim to confess whether the Quran is created or uncreated as part of his faith. So this is a theological argument among the theologians. They can settle it one way or the other, but have no bearing on the faith of the Muslim. And I have never seen a Muslim in my whole entire life that prays to the Quran. I had never seen a Muslim that had offered a prayer to the Quran like Christians do pray to Jesus. Now, my question is, the Quran presents a concept of God that is 100% compatible with what Noah believed, with what Abraham believed, with what Moses believed, with what Jesus believed and practiced, and with, Muhammad, with what Muhammad believed. The Trinity Creed presents or speaks of tri-personal existence of God, three different persons, and that is essential for the Orthodox Athanasius Creed or Trinity Creed that the persons, not three gods, but three persons combined in one Godhead. Now, my question to my Christian brothers here is, can you give me one single reference in which Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Noah, or any other prophet recognized to come by God that had spoke about three persons combined in one Godhead? Well, we have to recognize that in the scriptures we have several centuries of development and there's no obligation upon God to reveal the totality of truth to any one person at one time. He can reveal sufficient for that person's blessing and salvation. It was not uh, essential for Abraham, for example, to have a full understanding of, the, of uh, everything that would transpire in the future. Take, for example, he did really understand one thing, the whole do the doctrine of justification by faith without works, <coughs> without circumcision, something like that. He uh, apparently understood that, and that is something that uh, we see more fully developed at a later point. So we, we have to recognize that man is in time, and uh, uh, a truth like the Trinity is something that may be there implicitly and gradually there's a fuller revelation uh, given at a later point. 
that does not mean that the uh, uh, we're not saying that a, a, the, a full understanding of God is essential for salvation. You have admitted that yourselves for Islam and for Christians the same is true. God does not come nor does Jesus come and say well I will save you or I will forgive your sins if you understand everything about me and and make a complete theological statement. There's no obligation for that. Okay. And so uh, I think you're putting a demand upon us that uh, basically is not fair. Okay. Because then Islam doesn't do that. If we would ask you to to explain to us uh, some of some of the well the essence of God, you've just said well you don't need to know the essence of God. We know the attributes of God. I think this may be a revisionist view of of um, of uh, Islamic uh, theology myself. But um, uh, we think that the attributes of God are, are something also that are mysterious. Uh, if, if the attributes are as infinite as God is, well, they will be as difficult to comprehend fully as uh, the essence is itself. So in a sense, we're saying to you, if you will explain to us how uh, the, the relationship of the essence of God to the to all the attributes, and, and if you will explain to us some of the the intricacies intricacies of the of the doctrine of God in Islam, then you would have the right to ask us to to de give to you a detailed description of what God is like. But you don't do that, so you shouldn't expect us to do it either. Okay, yes. two points. Follow up. <coughs> the essence of God is revealed in the Quran in no uncertain terms, no ambiguity, no mystery in chapter 112. So the Muslims have no uh, confusion or no ambiguity about the nature of God. My second point, using the same measuring stick of the logic that you used, then I must believe also that throughout history, that we have a trinity that was established by the ancient Egyptians. Ray the father, Osiris the resurrected son, and Horus the paraclete. Do I accept that trinity to be a true nature of God simply because the ancient Egyptians... It is not a trinity. Well, that it is, is a form a of a trinity. There's no link between that, those three deities, and the doctrine of the trinity, if you understand it, either one of those. Well, it is a form of a trinity. Oh, is it? It is not a form of the trinity at all. It's just three... And, uh, and there's no link with the Trinity, if you understand the Trinity at all. Okay, then using the same measuring stick, the Hindus have a Trinity. No, they don't have a Trinity. All right. That's not a Trinity. You have to write tri theism. You okay. Keep the distinction clear. Okay. I see. So you do not consider the Christian Trinity to be comparable to the Hindu Trinity no. or to the ancient it's Egyptian not a Trinity. Trinity. Okay, what makes it distinct? Well, you have basically three different gods. You have a, there's no, no parallel. No Hindu scholar has ever uh, said that this is a, a parallel. This is a, the Trinity. All right. I mean, you can use terminology loosely, but that's not a Trinity. Okay. In the Gospel of Saint John, we read that Jesus, peace be upon him, was being baptized by John the Baptist. So here is Jesus as a person on the face of the earth. And when, while he was baptized, a voice was heard in heavens saying, this is my son in whom I am pleased. So we have a second person involved in action in the same time. And the gospel continues. And the multitude saw the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. So these are three different individuals, if you like to term individual, or persons, or entities, whichever definition you like, are engaged in action in the same time then what makes these three different individuals any different from the three individuals in the ancient Egyptian trinity or in the Hindu trinity? There's a basic fallacy here. To show a parallel in some place is equality. It's like someone saying there are pyramids in Mexico and there are pyramids in Egypt, therefore one came from the other or they are both the same. Or You, you can have... Uh, uh, any number of gods, and if they, in a certain place you have a, a set of three, it doesn't mean that that comes from or is the same thing as the Trinity. Uh, I think you, you're putting together things that are just arbitrarily chosen. No. Now, we could take things from Islam as well and say you are, uh, for example, the attention given to the Kaaba or to, the, or to a city. We could say, well, in Bali, Indonesia, they have a certain 
place they think is the center of the universe and everyone should look toward that and other primitive tribes and other places they have certain places which are very holy and then we could say oh they have this this idea of this one holy place islam has a mecca and a kaaba these must be there must be a link and and by association then say you, you are just uh, you just have an animistic or primitive belief so you're you're pulling together things i think in an illegitimate fashion well i don't know if it's <laughs> quite relevant anyway but anymore but uh, my my point was that um, Mm -hmm. That if you take, say, the, the God of Moses and the God of Paul, okay, before his, um, his conversion, certainly the same idea, the same understanding of God within the Jewish tradition. And when, when Paul was converted on the road to uh, Damascus, it wasn't that he changed gods. I don't think he began to worship a new god, but he, he saw God in a different way because of who Jesus was. Jesus makes a difference. Now, what that difference is, how that affects, how that impacts upon Christians, upon humanity, you know, this is, uh, can be argued in different ways, but somehow, when Jesus came, God was revealed in a way that, that was unique, that was different from what had ever happened before. And that difference was reflected in Paul's life and in many of the followers you know, that came after Jesus. Um, it is the same God, no question about it. You ask, you know, don't we all worship the same God? Yes, they do. But but there is something that happened in this Jesus of Nazareth that even a person like Paul, steeped in Judaism, he knew all the traditions, he knew all the laws, he, he worshipped God all the time. There was something about this Jesus of Nazareth that made him change his understanding about how God really operates or what God was doing in this uh, person from Nazareth. Amen. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out another fundamental objection or difference from the Muslim perspective <coughs> about this word, Quran, Jesus sort of analogy. For the Muslim, one of his problems with that analogy is, is that when he asks you to either accept or reject the Quran as the word of God revealed, he hands you the Quran, tells you to read it, and decide for yourself. So one objection he would have is that, you know, Jesus is dead. So when you ask him to accept Jesus as a revelation of God, how do, is he to examine that, to test it to be true? Now, you point to the fact of Paul's testimony and other, uh, Peter, uh, Paul and uh, John and et cetera, their testimony. But were there others that experienced Jesus that did not feel that he was the Son of God? I mean, if it just comes down to, an, uh, to a matter of testimony, what kind of argument do we have then? I mean, for the Muslim, he could directly argue, here is the Quran, test it. But there was a considerable difference of opinion in Christian circles through sev the first several centuries arguing about uh, what you're the ideas that you, you hold right now. And, and there's still a tr uh, debate raging in the Christian churches among Christian theologians today about the authenticity of the, the, the integrity of, this, of the New Testament. So, I mean, doesn't that put the Muslim in kind of a difficult place? You ask him to accept Jesus as the revelation of God, but he can't rely on that, and so he must rely on I wit uh, w witnessing. But to some extent, even Christians today, Christian scholars will admit that that witness is not entirely reliable. I think a lot of this will come up in the discussion tomorrow. I thought it would Let be a nice lead-in. Let me lead just in. Uh, remind you that uh, we talk about an inscripturated word and a word in flesh. Uh, we have been talking primarily about the word in flesh tonight. Right. Uh, but, but we, we have also, been drawing the analogy. We also uh, have an inscripturated word which we will be talking about tomorrow. 
And, uh, but would you agree with me, Doctor? Uh, uh, its relative reliability with the Quran, I think, will come up in right, tomorrow's right. discussion. But that, so that will I be would, the crux of the matter, then. I mean, that's where all, we've all been aiming towards tonight, hasn't it? Well, we have different. The word. It depends what you mean by aiming at. I'm just reminding you that we have right. an inscripturated and an enfleshed word. Right. And but, uh, we'll discuss that right. tomorrow. Okay. The difficulties that I'm having and is can with. We, can we allow that? No, oh, I'm sorry. Say, 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 can say I make it? Then I will make a comment. Maybe go. All right. Uh, if I can remember what I was going to say. Uh, Hart picks up uh, your comment about the unseen. And I think that relates also to this uh, question asked most recently by Jeffrey. Uh, the relationship of human beings with God is always a matter of faith, never of sight. Um, and God is unseen. Uh, at the same time, when the Christian talks about Jesus as the revelation and the presence of God, that is not a kind of presence of God that does not demand faith because what we expect of God is to be present in power but God is present in weakness God to be present in life and here God is present in death so uh, there's a hiddenness uh, in the in in Jesus Christ even at the same time as there, are, as there is a manifestation of, of God. Uh, and on the Trinity question, uh, the Trinity isn't some kind of idea that at least I as a Christian am in, interested in. It's, that's an abstraction. What the Christian is really concerned about is that in the encounter with Jesus Christ, we encounter God immediately. There's no distance there. It's an immediate, somehow, encounter with God. And the language about Trinity is language that developed within a Greek and Hellenistic context to try and make sense out of that experience. And Professor Badawi talked about the analogical character of language. We can't literalize it and sort of make it as an abstraction that is free-floating. So the only meaning of a doctrine of the Trinity uh, is a human effort to try and give language, yes. uh, in this case, within a Greek context, uh, about the meaning of Jesus. Yes, but, but now in the 20th century, I mean, I remember reading a book by a guy by the name of Karl uh, Rahner, I think, the German theologian. He was saying that the majority of Christians today are, have, believe in tritheism, you know, the Trinity for them has come to mean, for so many Christians, that there are three gods and three objects of worship. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that statement or not, but again, that comes back to something I said before, that the danger of the words is there. You know, he seems to acknowledge the same. In, in a book I just read of his on the Trinity, it said that maybe we need to reformulate the words, because the words have inherent dangers. They lead, easy, misguide or mislead easily into tritheism. And that's what his argument was, and I don't know if he resolved that difficulty or not, but that is the Quran's major complaint. When you say three, it almost immediately uh, you have allowed or opened the door to mislead and to misguide. And the Quran's intention is to guide correctly. And it, feels, and it, and it states very clearly that this is misguiding. We're saying it's one, though. That's what the Bible is said, talking about. It's one. It's the concept of oneness that's the problem. It's not that Christians are saying there are three gods. So that charge, we would feel, is just... It well, he, he, it did come from but, a Christian theologian. But, oh, well, he, he may make that, that statement, and there may be a lot of Christians that do that. Disagree. Just like you would not take responsibility for everything sure. that every Muslim does. But would you, or, would uh, you agree many, that many so, Christians pray to Jesus, for example? And that's, that's, that's validated by the revelation of God given in the New Testament. So you, you don't find anything wrong with that? No, I don't. I think that's what is the will of God. Now, it shouldn't be a problem to you because 
in, in the Quran itself, you have when uh, at the very beginning of creation, where God uh, tells the angels to, to bow down before Adam. And, and uh, if, if uh, it, it is legitimate and okay for God to tell uh, yes. the angels, and Satan then disobeys, and yes. then he becomes Satan. Sure, sure. You're beginning sure. of sin. Sure, but okay. that's your interpretation, so but the that, Muslim so interpretation. So if, if God can, yes, okay, let me finish. If God can tell the angels to bow down and worship uh, Adam, well, we think someone who is without sin, who is pure, even according to the, uh, according to the Quran, who is called a word from him and a spirit, who has some u unique link, and who claims to be a mediator, then uh, if God tells us to worship him, then uh, that is something to be done by the will of God. Yes, well, the Muslim has no problem with the fact that the angels were made to show their inferiority or potential inferiority to man. To man. That, but the Muslim doesn't believe that the angels therefore are made to worship man, to well, pray to man, to seek did. their they intercession. Bow down and him. No, no, yes, b so bowing down is not Could the I same add as. Could I one comment to you, please? <laughs> I've been busy my hand for a long time. Well, okay. The, uh, the reference. Uh, yes. yes. The reference that is made uh, in the Quran to the bowing down of the angels, nowhere in the Quran does it say bow down to angel and uh, to Adam and worship him. It doesn't. Bowing down means simply a show of respect because that would contradict everything else in the Quran about the exclusivity. Like that I has not before. been the historic understanding of Islam. Though. Let me just say, the exclusive uh, uh, worship of God and God alone, nobody besides him, nobody instead of him, not even through any of his creatures. So it doesn't have that signification at all that you, you, have, uh, you have raised. Secondly, on the question of uh, saying that when the disciples encountered Jesus, they encountered God without barriers. A Muslim can easily also say that when I stand up in my prayers, I encounter God without any barrier because we don't pray through Prophet Muhammad, we don't pray through the Quran, we pray directly to God. And again, uh, since the, uh, Dr. Martinson raised this issue of the analogical language that both of us agreed to, I think we have to apply it here as well. Uh, just like John Hick uh, indicates in his classic, introduction of his classic, The Myth of God Incarnate, when he says that the uh, disciples of Jesus were not writing simply as reporter, they were not Peter Arnett or uh, Peter Jennings. They were also reporting and interpreting their particular personal experience. And he said that they use this uh, metaphorical language to express the kind of spiritual experience in encountering Jesus. And as such, again, if we apply to this, the same rule of analogy or analogical language, one cannot take it really in the incarnational sense that was made to be uh, understood in later times. It's just like you see a holy man, a very good person, you're so much impressed with his character that you say, I encounter God in him, but not really meaning it in that literal sense. And in that metaphoric sense, it applies to people who encounter any prophet, for that matter, really. You find evidence of being, being so impressed and awed with the presence of the, of the prophet. Secondly, on the question of presence of God, presence of God doesn't have to be physical or any incarnational sense. Uh, presence of God can be felt in the heart of the individual, it doesn't necessarily have to take any particular manifestation uh, to have any uh, validity. And uh, when you compare, for example, the uh, demand of an evidence, scriptural evidence of the three in one, and you compare it, for example, with uh, the description of the essence of God, I, I don't think this is a fair analogy, if I were to be uh, open about that. Because the question of essence of God is a matter that is there from eternity and will remain until the day of judgment. So it's something of the foundation that doesn't change with time. Uh, whereas uh, the question of Trinity is not really something that you find traces even in the word of the prophet through whom it is believed that Trinity came to manifestation because he was the second person of the triune. He never mentioned that any, anything of, uh, of that nature. And if it is left to the experience, it's a matter of interpretation and that's disputed and have been disputed within the Christian community anyway. If it is a matter of uh, interpretation or experiential element, 
that grew up in a later time, then obviously one has to question what is the basis of that uh, statement and you can accept it or reject it because it is not really the divine word of God, it is the interpretation or experience. And as uh, Jeffrey mentioned earlier, not all people have that experience. Uh, Hans Kung, for example, called the early Christian Jewish Christians. And they see Jesus as no more than an Israelite prophet. And they were totally foreign to these ideas that developed at, at a later time. But tomorrow, perhaps, we might touch also on the question of relevance of experience and what exactly the word mystery mean in both communities. Just, just one very quick comment on one point I think is, is, is very critical. Uh, if it is so, as Hick says, then the early disciples were guilty of shirk. They were idolizing their own experience. But their word was Lord. This is Lord. It was not a statement about their experience. It was a statement about what they recognized this Jesus Christ to be. And the minute you have a distance placed between Christ and God, and then, then it becomes a matter of shirk. Uh, shirk cannot be where there is no space between. Uh, it's in that sense that I talk about immediate, not in an emotional sense, but in a revelatory sense. Two comments on that. It is quite true that if the historical narratives are correct, and that's another question, that some people upheld that view, yes, they committed shirk. But what I'm saying here, that original Christians, people who were closer even to the time of Jesus, they did not all share that idea, and as such, we cannot accuse them all of committing shirk. It was a matter of, of difference of their experiential uh, type of uh, encounter with Jesus, peace be upon him. So in that sense, yes, some of them did commit shirk, but the question again here, and I think you're aware of that, uh, that whether or not this was really the experience that they reported, whether the words attributed even to the writers of the various Gospels were written by those. And mm. you're definitely aware of the controversy, for example, as to the Gospel of John. Was it written by John, the son of Zebedee, or someone else? So there are questions of authentication on one hand, and that's coming for tomorrow. And there's a question even aside from that issue of authentication of uh, whether there was any unanimity on that. There have been no unanimity of that, and the argument in the Council of Nicaea was raging the idea of Trinity even was not all perfected in the 325. As you know, the role of the Holy Spirit came in a later conference. So it's, it's not as simple as it may uh, appear on the surface. But like, as, like uh, Dr. Woodbury said, perhaps we'll be coming back to these issues. And yeah, there wasn't any unanimity about the Quran in the early period, or else Uthman wouldn't have had to burn any of the materials there. So That's a misconception too, but we'll, we'll come to that tomorrow. Well, but that wasn't <laughs> there was definite unanimity on the Quran. There could be no question about it, but we'll, well, we'll come there, to that there tomorrow. There is a question about that. We'll, we'll come to that tomorrow. To that. Okay. And there we'll is an answer that. for it. The problem no, that nobody, nobody said in the Quran, nobody believed in a Quran that says Muhammad is a, is a, is a God incarnate, and another said that Muhammad, yeah, our experience with him is a prophet. There is nothing close to that proportion at all. Okay, he never claimed to be a God. That's true. We'll come to that tomorrow. When we discuss about the Quran, maybe that will give you whatever the chest they in to produce us a different version of the Quran so we can take a look at it. <laughs> we'll get to that anyway. Uh, okay. Much closer. Sure. <laughs> uh, see, we're talking about the most important issue between Islam and Christianity. We're talking about God, the Creator. We're talking about the one for whom we are gathering tonight. And we are talking with consciousness, all of us. And everyone takes it seriously that what we're talking about will form and shape every one of us's destiny in this life and in the hereafter. It is not really a matter of intellectual discussion because we're not here for that. We are here to, to address this real issue. Uh, talking about the word of God, Jesus, uh, and I have here uh, hundreds of quotes before him and after him and from him talking about the word of God as something other than himself and if I am to quote I will take half an hour I'm serious he is Jesus himself talking about the not e the word of God as something other than himself give us an example well here 
Well, it's, this is known. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He asked for it. Just give us an example. Jesus okay. believed in the Old Testament. That was the word of God. Can so we've, is, already, yeah. we've already admitted that, that there is an inscripturated word and there is a living word. So no, what I'm, what I'm saying is when Jesus... You're not expressing anything we don't. Uh, you understand. agree with what I'm saying? I don't what have I'm to... What I'm saying is there's an inscripturated word. Which means? And there is... The incarnated um, word. We, we'll discuss yes. that more tomorrow. Can, can I just... Can I finish what I have to say? <laughs> okay. This time. Okay. Yes. okay. Sure. Okay. sure. What, what I'm saying is, if it is really what you say it is, right? And I do believe with all honesty that you're so uh, straightforward about it with us tonight. If you believe so that Jesus had one mission coming to this earth, which is to convey to people, I am the incarnation of God. If this is the ultimate, absolute, most important purpose of his mission, how can this be left up to people's inferences? Can I answer that? Yeah, that's I, well, I don't I'd like accept to respond to that, because yeah. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't go around with a sign, I am God, or, unless you believe I am deity... I'm sorry, I'm it seems I did not so make he, my question clear. Well, I didn't say that he said. What I'm asking is, if his main purpose and main mission is to convey to me and you that I am Jesus, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, he said this, and I believe it. So far, you're okay. Okay? So but if it is part of his mission, if it is the most important part of his mission, is to convey to me as well to you that I am God incarnate. My question is... <coughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't his mission. No, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, this is the point of Jesus' Then coming. maybe I rephrase God my question. Do you believe that Jesus is God incarnate? Yes, I do. But, that, but that's another whole... But well, you asked me another question. I want I to said, ask you another the main question. Point? And the main point... I will is ask you. I will Jesus ask you. came okay. and in order to seek and to save which, that which was lost. He didn't come around and, and require anyone to sign a doctrinal statement, affirm the Trinity. He didn't do that. He was willing to help people and save people. He talked in Mark t uh, 2 about he would forgive sins. And he would, uh, well, as we know, he did many things. But what he came to do was to help us and not primarily to get a doctrinal statement. That doesn't mean that a doctrinal statement isn't true, that this will not be revealed in time. It just means his primary purpose is uh, to bring salvation to us. That's but his pr primary role. My question still stands. He came as a manifestation of God. Right, and that is the ultimate maximum achievement that Jesus made or gave to the Christians. No, it isn't. He wasn't do doing that directly himself. He was going around and, 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 and telling people he's fundamentally the mediator. There's a verse in Timothy which talks about this. There is one God, we all believe that, and one mediator between man and God. And then it says, the man Christ Jesus. Now the point is, Jesus came to help and save Muslims. They don't have to have a full, accurate doctrinal statement first. No, no, no. He's, he says he's the mediator, and then it calls him the man. Now you have to consider the possibility that God has permitted that there be a means of salvation which is encompassed in this person excuse as me. a man. Excuse me. Now, now beyond that, there may be further truth which we do not the, know. Just there's as just you one. Say you know the attributes of God, but do not know the essence of God. I'm sorry for you interruption. You may know that Jesus is the mediator, but beyond that, there may be other things that will come out later. But again, once again, I'm pressing the point because it is the most important point that I personally would like. I would like to understand it. Yeah. That's me. I would like to understand it. Here is God who is three in one and one in three. For the first time in history, according to Dr. Woodbury, revealing himself in human flesh, that is the most important event in history. Yet not one single word that says incarnate, God in flesh, uh, three in one, 
I am the manifestation of God. He didn't utter the conclusion that every Christian theologian holds up to heaven and say, this is my faith. My question is so obvious. I am in search. And I am serious. I am in search of the fact. Why is this single most important utterance was not mentioned on the tongue of Jesus Christ? I think your message is clear. I'm sorry for uh, interruption. I, I We're running out I of time. I'm, 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 I'm asking for an answer, Hamid. To say, but okay. we'll never end like Hamid, this, so. I'm asking for an answer. I will not you comment already, again. Okay. You already an, asked and you already answer. answered, so I, you forgive me for uh, ending this part of the program because Let we have to move to the one. other part. <laughs> okay. Just, just a second. Uh, we'll take your comment please quickly and then we'll take your comment quickly and then we'll move to the audience Jesus please. did not come to convey information Jesus came to be the very presence of God's love that's what the Christian believes thank you well to that end a Muslim will believe that every messenger that came from God is to convey God's love mm -hmm. and I would like to make one remark to correct the verse that was given by Reverend Chastain on the lips of Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. <coughs> For there is only one God, the Father. You dropped out the Father. So the identification here, there is only one God, the Father, and one mediator between man, between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So Paul himself identified only one God, and that is the Father. Now, as far as the remark was made before that uh, Paul, you know, understanding of God did not change from his Jewish background, the, Paul did not establish the Trinity. 325 years after Jesus, the Council of Nicaea talked about Father and Son, and they have to have a second Council of Nicaea to add the Holy Spirit to it. So this issue was not established by Paul, and Paul did not change his views from being Jewish to being uh, Christian. Uh, 325 years, they were still debating that in the Catholic councils. And Arius, who is the deputy of Athanasius, completely rejected the idea of uh, the Trinity. So there was no ever a, 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 an agreement even between Christians themselves 325 years after Jesus about the doctrine of Trinity. Thank you. Now we'll move to the audience. Who wants to be the first to uh, uh, make his comment? Uh, 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 I, I get some guests who are coming from a long distance, so you forgive me, the local people, to move to the uh, people who are already traveled and took the pain of coming from a long distance. Go ahead. And this is Hamza. Give him the mic here so that people can hear. Well, so it's also both. Might need it for taping. Oh, you put it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Not that big one, but, <laughs> but don't go home with it. So many questions. Maybe I can get back to the second one. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to understand something. We've been talking about quite a few things tonight. Uh, my understanding, from what I have uh, uh, heard and from what I have studied concerning this uh, doctrine of incarnation. In uh, First John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among the people. My point is, I'd like to preface my question with an uh, observation. Uh, I understand that this incarnation was for the purpose of Jesus experience, having the human experience, that God incarnated in human form so that Jesus could uh, experience the human, have the uh, a human experience, and for the ultimate purpose of dying for the sins of mankind, to die for the sins of mankind. Is that correct? That Jesus came to die for the sins of mankind. That's not correct? I'm getting some shaking yes and some no's. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the point is that. What you're saying is it accomplished a number of things that included this. Ultimately, right? the death. And resurrection. No. And resurrection. resurrection. Okay, death and resurrection. Okay, so now the point is that we understand from the Gospel of John that God is a spirit. 
and that he should be worshiped in spirit and truth. And the Greek word there, I believe, is pneuma. Is that correct? So Jesus incarnated in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Greek word there, if I'm not mistaken, is sarx, something to that nature, S-A-R-X, if it's pronounced. Sarx. Okay. So now he's a flesh uh, personality. Here. My point is, after he has accomplished his death and resurrection, how, how or when did he go back to being spirit again? Spirit. Or is he still entrapped in this flesh body at this moment now? Because in Luke chapter uh, uh, 24, verse 39, uh, uh, I believe it is, it says that Jesus, when the, his disciples, when he came in the upper room, they perceived that he was a spirit. He says, how me and see, for spirit has no flesh and bone as you see me have. So therefore, he's still in that state of flesh that he has incarnated in. I want to know, when did he get back to being spirit again? As he prayed in John chapter 17, verse 5, O oh, my Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I have with thee before the world began. That was his prayer. I'm believing that that prayer didn't get accepted like the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, which didn't get accepted, according to your theology. So now I want to know, what condition is Jesus in at the moment? Is he spirit? Or he's, he's still entrapped in flesh, because if he's in no, flesh, he can't die anymore. Each other. And, and the, the scripture teaches a transformation that takes place, where you might say there's a new ecology. God is creating a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus is the first one to enter into that. And he has a renewed body. It is a spiritual body, which is spoken about. I have to read in 1 Corinthians. 15, tell, tell me your answer is 1545, this is Paul's doctrine of a spiritual body which contradicts, I said again, Jesus' concept mm -hmm. and, and Luke. It contradicts that. No, it doesn't necessarily, no. Well, you said necessarily, I'm, I'm saying well, again. Because you have a trend, you, again, you're in process in time, and you have Jesus in the flesh. He now is, is risen, and in, in a new form, and if, you, if you remember the story of the resurrection, he could go eat food if he wished. But he also could go through a wall. No, it doesn't say. No, it doesn't say. It doesn't say that. This is your what stuff. It says that Jesus came into the upper room and the doors were closed. It doesn't say that it remained closed or that he oozed under or through the doors. This is no, something no, no, different. But the idea is that it's a new type. It's a new kind of uh, resurrected body. It's a spiritual body. See, the so point could is this. Could I just now. make one yeah. comment? It, there's an assumption which I think uh, is confusing and which I don't find helpful. Mm. In your comments, it seems, is that spirit means disembodied. Uh, spirit means essentially, in the biblical context, power. And so the Spirit of God moved when we talk about, when, when the Old Testament talks about creation, the Spirit of God moved. Mm -hmm. And when it talks about the birth of Jesus, it talks about the Spirit. When it talks about the resurrection of Jesus, it talks, it talks about, about the Spirit. It talks about formless, formless. And without form. It, it moved over that and gave it form. So that I'm, I'm this, talking about this the entity itself had no form. Hmm. Not what it gave form to, the, spirit, the oceans and so forth. I'm talking about the entity itself as a spirit had no form. God has no form, you see. He's a spirit in yes, worship. Yes, but, but that's spirit. not the main point of spirit. The main point of spirit it is God's power. <laughs> is that po does that power have form? This is what we say, so that it can be contained in a, a location. The power gives form. So my point is this, you see, this uh, gentleman here quoted uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, pa pa Paul's uh, doctrine about the resurrected body of Christ, which he gave a uh, misunderstanding uh, about not having witnessed that uh, scene in the upper room, the whole scenario there from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 8, something that the first understanding we get about the resurrection in the New Testament there is there. That's the concept there from Paul, who gave a misconcept about this infor information. Well, what, what he gives, just, just a minute, what he gives in verse 40, there, and this is for the basis for the resurrection of the dead. He's trying to give understanding to those yeah. uh, who die. 
And all he says, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. He does not define what that is. He says that that, that body is sown, a natural body is raised in spiritual bodies. What yes, is the Greek terms used there for natural body and spiritual body? Okay, what we have to understand. the natural is what we live in right here. It's the and what physical he's, body. What he's indicating, it is a different yes, kind of body. He does Thank not define the details of you. what so that was. He just says it's different. But you have a Greek word there. What is those Greek words? What is the spiritual body? What is the Greek word? Hamid, can I, can I ask? Give a chance. You want to make a comment on, on the same point? I would like to. OK, just go ahead. Okay. And then we'll have Reverend uh, Here McCord. Here is uh, the expository dictionary of the biblical words. OK, that's a dictionary. It says that the spirit pneuma primarily denotes the wind. Uh, the spirit is like the wind. It's invisible, immaterial, powerful, disembodied, invisible part of man, and it gives on and on. That's what it is. You want to have a comment? Any comment on what he said? It's just that Dr. Uh, Paul yeah, when, said when? It, is, it is not disembodied, so I... I just remember reading that it is disembodied. It is, it is not that it is. That, that is simply not the scriptural point. The, the scriptural this is the point is that the spirit is the power of God. That's what it's about. And we've already talked about the God being invisible. Uh, and no, we're talking we, about the term spirit in the biblical usage of it. Yes, this and, is that, what and that is means about. power. The power of God. Wherever it's talking the about the spirit, it's talking about the power okay. of God. Is it okay. possible for God to create a different kind of a body? He can do anything. Does it have to be fleshly or, or some kind of a spirit? Because can it be something that is new? God can do that. That's what we're saying. If it's spiritual, it can't be a body. But if those terms deliberately chosen in order to show to you, if you're open, that God is going to do something new and different. And so if you want, well, which is it, this or that, and, and, and First Corinthians is trying to clearly say it, it's it, neither one is fully true. There, is, yeah, there well, is body only because there is spirit. That's what I it think means. I, I guess we did enough on this point, so <laughs> let's <laughs> move to it. Over <laughs> you spiritualized the point. Yeah. I understand we're just to ask one question, so I'm going to divide. talks louder like you. Yes, right. No problem. Uh, so I'm going to divide my question in half, one for each side of the, uh, of the panel. I'd like to ask uh, the Muslim members of the panel, is it possible, and I've framed this question very carefully, is it possible for God to give a revelation in the form of a human person? Is it possible? And I'd like to ask uh, the Christians on the panel, is it possible for God to give a revelation in the form of a book? Which half of the question you want to answer? Which one? Ha which oh, half we, first? We want to know. The first half. <laughs> okay. On this half, if you mean by God giving revelation in a form of a human in a sense that that human becomes the embodiment of the teaching and the word of God in non-incarnational form then it's not only possible I believe it happened with all prophets yes that sounds good to me <laughs> <laughs> the answer to the second half is yes <laughs> Okay. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, and maybe we should add, it's premised on the conviction that all things are possible to God. There is no limit to divine sovereignty and divine possibility. Okay. Move to this side. Yeah, I, I hope I understood you well. You said that God came in the form of a human being, Jesus Christ to save a humanity. After the crucifixion, and when we are gathered all in heaven, is Jesus going to go back and reconnect with God again, and we will see one God? And 
think there's a problem here that we face that we have, should recognize before we get an answer. Yeah. And, and, and I think the problem is you, you have a fixation on the numerics of God. There's a problem. The, the, the you started is, it. The Christian is looking at God not uh, in terms of his mathematics, but basically, you, you might say organically he, or personally. He's a person. And, uh, and uh, the fixation is on getting the number right. And I, I've met uh, Muslim friends, and they thought as long as they said they got the number right, number one, God's number one, then they've got it made. Some thought they were going to get go to paradise forever, j just as long as they got the number right. Now, the scriptures c clarify, to the Christian at least, that even if you believe God was one and absolutely one, even as the Muslim believes he is one, numerically one, then uh, it doesn't do any good because the, the, the demons believe and they tremble. So the, the, the number of God is not a saving truth. And that's one reason why it's not stressed. And also the other reason that was revealed a little while or mentioned a while ago, in the Jewish community it was no problem. Everybody believed God was one. And so they didn't have to articulate or make a big issue out of it. But we believe that there's a concept of oneness. Now our problem is not so much getting the number right, one to three, but what does oneness mean? Since a Christian says, and he honestly says, that God is one. We believe that, well, even human beings are not merely mathematically one. We believe, that Christians believe, you consist of a body. To, use, to try to use an illustration that may be helpful, I hope it's helpful. The body is a physical part, and there's some spiritual part. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it talks about a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, when I came in here, you didn't give me three chairs. I have my body sit here, my spirit body, sit here, soul, and spirit. my soul sit there. You gave me one chair. And, and basically, uh, all that I am is in that one chair. And, and I think Muslims and Christians are agreed that human beings are not just a pile of meat and bones. We're not merely flesh. There's a spiritual dimension to human beings. So you have a composite even within us. Oneness on the human dimension is more than absolute mathematical oneness. We're talking about a composite oneness, a complexity in oneness. So my suggestion, we would be able to understand each other better if you realize you're focusing in on the mathematics, we're focusing in on God as a person and a relationship. And if we throw this back and forth at each other, we can go on everlastingly, and we'll never come to any kind of understanding of each other. No, I'm, Thank I'm you. having a trouble. Yeah. Yeah, just a I, I have a comment here on the... Okay. Well, yeah. Let's the uh, yeah. reaction. Yes. I'm having trouble with what Reverend Chastain's a comparison that uh, he gave because one of the explanations that had been always given about the Trinity that inside you there is a father, there is a son, and there is a husband, one, but two, still one, two, three, but there is still one of you. But this is not does not match the definition or the orthodox definition mm -hmm. of the Trinity, which is essential to separate the father from the son from the Holy Spirit, yet you turn around and say these three are uh, one. Now, the father in me cannot be with my son in the school, and the husband in me cannot be with my wife at home, while the son in me cannot be with my father uh, in another city. These are attributes of an individual. These are not dry personal existence. This is the proper explanation for the Trinity Creed, dry personal existence of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when you say that within me there is spirit and the soul and the body, yet when you came in we did not give you three chairs, the comparison here is a little bit incorrect, not uh, accurate to say the least. This is number one. Number two, if the Trinity is such an important doctrine, and such a mystery that I must understand and I must devote my life to it. Why wouldn't Jesus speak about it openly since Athanasius and the Trinity Creed spoke about it openly and they said and they discussed it? Why would God trust it to Athanasius and the uh, Council of Nicaea and the other Catholic councils 
and Jesus himself would not speak about it. Uh, why, would it why, why does he have to be ambiguous about it? Why does he have to just give clues about it? Why doesn't he just come out and say, listen, this is essential for your salvation and it is such and such and such and such. You see, this illustrates my point. You've brought out your calculator again. You've added the model. And, you're, you're t and you're also and the fixation on the, uh, the, the con con council. The, I'm not the one that brought out the calculator. It was Jesus who brought out the calculator, and it was Moses who brought out the calculator. Because when Jesus was asked which one is the first among all the commandments, he brought out the calculator, and he said, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. So I'm not the one that's bringing out the calculator. You would believe, I think, that God has a spirit, wouldn't you? Why doesn't Paul make the, the comment here? Because we well, have. I, I was just going to say, with respect to the doctrine of the Trinity, and Jesus didn't uh, formulate a doctrine of the Trinity. Again, I would like to emphasize that Jesus did not come to convey information. He came to convey and be the love of God in our presence, and we cannot confuse revelation and doctrine. Revelation is a divine activity. Doctrine is a human activity. Which could be wrong as humans? Which can be wrong. Yes. Yeah. That's what Muslims may be. Okay. One, one, one yeah. more comment. Okay. The reason I'm asked, because you said that, because I had, I had a conversation three days ago with, the, with a very good friend of mine. He's a Christian. He said that God is one, just like you, what you believe Muslims. Then he came in the form. He said, what happened when he came in the form of a human being? He said, he gave up his Godship. Okay, then after his death, after his death and crucifixion, he went back to heaven. He should go back to the form of one God. And the, according to the Bible, in heaven, we will see both God and the Son. Even if we go with that logic, what, what, what about the other manifestation, the third manifestation, the Holy Spirit? What happened to it in heaven? Thank you. I think you made your comment. Any of the ladies want to make a statement or, or a comment? Okay. Thank you. My name is Ghazi. And uh, if you state a fact once, then you state it 10 times. Does it make it more true when you state it 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times? If it is true, one time is enough, ten times is enough, there's no point of going and say, stating it a thousand times or a hundred thousand times, it doesn't make it more true. And uh, I'm referring here to the question of love, the love of God. Uh, the Quran does specifically say, They take idols that they love as they should love God, but the believers are most intense in their love of God. So the Quran establishes that the most intense relationship between man and God is love. And 10, 15 times it said he loved these and he loved these and he loved these that you have pointed out. So once you have established that the strongest relationship is love and repeat it 10 times, to repeat it 1,000 times or 2,000 times, does not going to make it any more true. Another verse in the Quran speaks about God. <coughs> we provide for both the righteous and the unrighteous because the gifts of God are unrestricted. So that is an expression of love where it speaks even extended to those who do not love God. Okay? So, yes, I'm here. Yes. So, so the point is here that I'm driving at is this. Once you have stated it and established that it is the strongest relationship, it is taken for granted after that, that that's, a, that's what it is. And every attribute of God, mercy, grace, forgiveness, is an expression of love. Once you understand this, then really no difference, to my understanding, between the stress on the love of God that in the Christian point of view, love is a stronger one than the Muslim point of view. In my view, they are the same. Just in one, uh, the New Testament in particular, it is mentioned more, but not because it is stronger between Muslim and uh, God than in the case of the Christians. This is the same, just a matter of frequency, and the frequency does not change the intensity or the essentiality of it. Okay. Thank you.
Go ahead, please. Yes, I would, uh, I would say that what, <coughs> what we as Christians see in Christ is that we see God actively at work overcoming evil, freeing us from the power of evil. That is, in Christ we see the, the way God uh, overcomes and uh, is victorious over the power of evil, which is very much in us as individuals, and that somehow in Christ it is actually God at work uh, struggling with evil, and finally, in, in, in all that Christ does, there is the victory of God over the power of evil. Now, I would like to say, and this can be elaborated and explained, but I would like to ask, in um, the world is very our, our Muslim, <laughs> our Muslim <laughs> friends, Still. how does God, in Islam, how does God overcome evil? Where, where do you see God as it were, overcoming mm. evil, mm. or do you, or does God, uh, by giving us the, the prophets, the holy books, and so on, does he enable us to overcome evil? Are we the victor, are we the ones who are victorious over evil, or is God, and then God gives us the victory? I mean, uh, let's, uh, could we, could we just, you know, talk about that a minute, because it seems to me then we become very close to what Christians believe is actually happening in the very life and the death and resurrection of Jesus uh, the Christ. Thank you. I think we'll be finishing in about three minutes. So we'll have to. No, you know, I am very brief. Two yeah. points. One, uh, what you stated, which is very touching and nice, talk about uh, seeing God in action through the person of Christ. Again, in the allegorical sense, I have no difficulty with that, except that it applies to all prophets. Exactly every prophet, really, in allegorical sense, not incarnation, sense, is God in action, helping people and overcoming evil. So I have no difficulty with that, but it applies to all prophets. The second observation is, uh, how do we overcome sin? Well, there is a beautiful ayah in the Quran. وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ Anyone who has faith in Allah, Allah will guide his heart. So yes, we can do it alone, but we have to show that faith, we have to show that Iman, and then God will guide us, guide our hearts. So so it, it is man then that finally has the victory over, over evil? Well, it, it, again, it's a matter of uh, terminology, and what do we mean by that terminology? Because on one sense, you can also say that in Islamic theology, everything is by the will of God. All power is in the hand of God. So in, on one level, you could say, all right, it is God who overcame evil through your iman through your effort. So in one sense, it's God who's doing it. In another sense, also, you're taking some steps to do that. So it depends what level of analysis we're looking at. Okay. It's let no us, difficulty let at us, all uh, Interaction. Let's finish, please. Uh, we we want to finish, so we never end. So, so you forgive me. We'll have to finish. We'll make, uh, we'll take a comment from here, a comment from here, and we'll conclude. Okay? So go ahead, uh, Dr. Jeffrey. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I you forgot to move to Shaker if you forgot. No, uh, I just would like to say that the standpoint of the Quran is, is it comes down to, and this will be taken up later, why are we here in the first place? Why does God create an environment which has uh, pain and suffering and sin and evil in the first place? I'm not going to answer the question today, but I'm just pointing to the fact that this is what we'll be taking up in Sunday. The real question that atheists have as we go ahead debating back and forth here about things, is why does God create an environment where there is evil and suffering and terrible tragedy in the first place? And if he, you know, when I was a Christian and they told me that Jesus, through his death, we conquered sin and pain and suffering, well, I looked around me and man is still evil, there's plenty of suffering, there's still plenty of pain. If he conquered it, why is it still here? So, you know, these are the questions I think we'll be taking up in the next few days, but this is a central question. Why do we, is, do we live in a world where there is such, such suffering? Why does God put us in an in a, a environment where we can uh, uh, go astray, where we do have choices? These are the key questions I think we have to ask in the next couple of days. Thank right, you. just to sort of tie this together and lead on, as you have mentioned, 
obviously sin pain and suffering are going to come where there is free will and we will be dealing with that uh, in the uh, future uh, what we see here though I think we've seen a couple of things tonight uh, one of them is that uh, there is a very strong emphasis on relationship in the Christian message that God wants to be related to us and uh, <laughs> Hence, there is the desire not only to reveal uh, his will, but to reveal, uh, in a sense, his character so that we can become related to him. This is a very strong uh, Christian emphasis. And then, then as far as the love of God comes, uh, God is called the Wudu, the loving one in Islam. Both of us believe that there is a God of love. But this emphasis on relationship gives a biblical understanding that God is going, that God has reached to us while we are still in our sinful state uh, and died for us when we were still in our sinful state rather than uh, what we've seen as the emphasis of God loves those who love him and are righteous and does not love those who don't love him and are not righteous. Well, this, I... It's this breaking through uh, that is a very strong uh, biblical emphasis. Well, I thank you all for your well, that, Dr. Jamal, by the way, didn't have the time. Just one quick no, point. Uh, please, you let know how brief I am. We have to 15 finish. seconds. <laughs> we have to one, finish. Sorry. One is the, uh, yeah. I can't still see uh, in what sense there is more uh, emphasis in Christianity on relationship of the character of God. Like I mentioned before, we can see that in the character of the prophets, there is a hadith that say, to try to emulate. Of course, not the exclusive divine attribute of God, but the other thing like kindness, like mercy, like compassion. So I don't see that difference at all. Secondly, the question of God reaching to us while we are in our sins, this is also our understanding. After all, prophets are not coming to good people, they're coming to sinners. Just like Jesus said, you know, if a person is, is healthy, he doesn't need a doctor. It's the, the sin, sinful who need. So the reaching out is there. So again, I feel that in many points, including the last two points made by Dr. Woodbury, uh, I'm very glad that we met together to dialogue because sometimes we may have uh, an imagination of artificial difference which is not there, uh, which is developed by th some theologians somehow to show that one is different. Yes, there are differences, but not in some of these areas that we discussed tonight, especially insofar as the question of love and relationship is concerned. Well, I really thank you all, and uh, I hope I'll see you all uh, tomorrow morning. And we promise we're not gonna gonna be going according to the schedule starting from tomorrow. So.